conducting this conference within the frame of La Semana de la Evidencia to promote and celebrate the use of evidence in public policies in Latin America. Our conference is a joint effort of the British Embassy and British Council in Peru. My name is Corina Villacorta and I work with the British Council with the Newton Fund in Peru and I will be today your moderator. I would like to start by saying a few words about the Newton Fund. The Newton Fund aims to promote the economic development and social welfare of the partner countries or through working with the partner country to address the well-being of communities. It is part of the UK's official development assistance. Now, I would like to explain the order of sequence for this conference. Today, we have three panelists who will share their learnings and experiences. Each of them will have a first round of 10 minutes. After each panelist speaks, you can write down in the chat your comments and questions. Please write the name of the panelist to whom you are addressing your question or your comment. At the end of the presentation of the third panelist, we will have time for responding to questions and react to comments by our panelists. We will then have a second round for each panelist to present their final comments and conclusions. Please keep your microphone mute and your video off at all time. And thank you once again for joining this virtual conference call. I would like now to introduce Peter Cousins, who is our first panelist. Peter Cousins is lead Latin America Science and Innovation at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy base of the UK. And he is a graduate from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Karina. A pleasure to join everybody um, this morning and this afternoon, respectively. Um, obviously, the Newton Fund is the primary focus of what we're looking at here. I have the pleasure to oversee the Newton Fund from London across the five countries in Latin America that it focuses on. Um, so as I have the pleasure to work in so many places, I also have to admit that compared to other panelists, I don't have the same experience of individual programs under Newton in detail, those who've worked in specific countries and greater detail. But I will cover what I think Newton adds on to the value of evidence in policy and how it can support the use of evidence in policy making. But I'm going to also take the opportunity after that to discuss very briefly some of the other things that we have in the UK geared towards supporting the use of policy, uh, sorry, of evidence within policy making here. I think it's useful to see how we tackle the issue and how we've acknowledged that it is that in the recent past we have had a lack of the use of evidence and we have suffered consequences from having policies that have not been as informed as they could have been and some of the efforts that we've made to address that. But to the Newton Fund itself, I think it comes to the fundamental element of what we're looking for in evidence and policy making. And I imagine when we're talking about kind of knotty issues and some of the sensitivities and how one gets the latest research into the various policy makers spaces so that it's considered, we typically think more of relations and gaining the due attention that evidence deserves. Practically, of course, we have to have the evidence in the first place. And I think that is where the Newton Fund crucially comes in, that it focuses on the development issues, as uh, Karina mentioned, it is part of the UK's official development assistance. It focuses very much on particular issues agreed between the UK and in Peru's case, Peru, we operate in 18 countries around the world. And the immediate hope for impact is what the topic matter of that research is. But the fundamental benefit that lasts far beyond any single piece of research is the additional capacity within a particular sector of research, 
but more broadly the actual research base within any partner country and within ourselves we work on the basis of primary and secondary benefits within the fund and one of our motivating factors for the newton fund is to support research from our own environment from our own institutions a greater amount of it and to support the strength of our own research base i think that is something that newton offers every single partner country in that it is supporting additional research those are resources that may well be focused on a particular program currently but they are skills that last it is capacity that lasts and that that enables countries communities in the future to have a greater range of resources to call upon to inform policy making um, in the peruvian case at the moment i imagine many on the um, teleconference or video teleconference will be familiar with some of the themes that the newton fund is focusing on already but as the starting point we work on funding cycles much like everywhere else the starting cycle between the uk and peru on the newton fund is focusing on health uh, particularly nutrition uh, water security and biodiversity those are vast areas of research we will only naturally be able to focus in relatively tightly but i think with all countries that newton works with it focuses on identifying areas of excellence within partner countries and opportunities for high quality joint research we don't start from nothing by any means we have skills on both sides and the hope is to develop those areas of excellence into strong sectors within the research base in our respective countries so i think that is how i would frame newton as the greatest benefit to using evidence in policy making is simply in supporting the creation of evidence and the presence and capability of experts within partner countries yes in reality on any detailed topic we would encourage and we do look for the best international expertise on a topic but it is important to have people within one's own community and one's own country addressing the greatest possible breadth of issues and able to offer informed advice off topic a little but before i have to pass on to the next speaker i should say that we in the uk have essentially one large network explicitly geared towards supporting evidence in policy making and also something of a sort of a long standing tradition uh, the long standing tradition is something that we uh, i'm sure that someone most nostalgic about history would tell you about the enlightenment and newton and a variety of aged scientists but i shan't do that to you more practically we have something that we refer to as the haldane principle uh, it was established in 1918 and that essentially is geared towards ensuring that the evidence that we get is as scientifically rigorous as possible it explicitly sets out that there shouldn't be political interference in the selection of science programs and in the selection of research projects it's around the independence of academia and of researchers and that it is best to allow fellow researchers and the academic community to an extent to police itself and to judge its own merits it is around the value of peer review versus political review or review by public opinion i think it's in our sense and in the importance of evidence and the value it makes to policy making it's important to get evidence to policy making but its worth is because it isn't influenced too heavily by the policy 
it is supposed to influence the policy. One doesn't want to end up with evidence or essentially policy-based evidence. We all, in a political environment, choose sometimes what pieces of evidence to focus on. But ensuring an independence in academia is an excellent way to try and at least ensure that the material and the breadth of the material is there and it is based on the rigour of the evidence and the rigour of attempting to reach that evidence on one's findings, not in order to please a particular funding body or political system. On a more practical basis, more recently, we've instituted a series of chief government, uh, sorry, chief scientific advisors. We have a government chief scientific advisor who sits uh, roughly at the authority of a cabinet minister who is responsible for advising the prime minister on scientific matters and research matters, not, I should say, research policy and research funding. That is still a ministerial position, but scientific issues and immediate advice to the Prime Minister. That chief scientific advisor oversees two networks. One is a series of scientific advisors in every single government department. Um, there'll normally be one or two missing because it's a slow recruitment process and they move around, but it's we've identified having a champion within each department is extremely valuable in ensuring that the work of that department takes into account the most relevant evidence and information that to a degree yes at a point it has to be political decision making but that they consider the, all of the valid evidence and are made aware of things and civil servants can be a very away from science and from research in the widest terms, whether that be social sciences, arts and humanities or physics. But specific advisors are placed within each department reporting into the government's chief scientific advisor to ensure that there is coherent net there that puts back gently. It provides information and encourages those officials and politicians to make sure that they're considering the evidence that could be available. The other side, or an additional network, is much broader, and that is the view of essentially professional scientists within government, a grouping of officials throughout departments, um, analysts, social scientists, the government science and engineering network is again supported by the government's chief scientific advisor to maintain equality and standards through their profession and to share each other's experiences in trying to bring their technical skills and scientific rigor into a policy environment. But it is also about acknowledging the importance of that advice, not bringing in scientists simply to smother them in official or generalist language and our standard ways of working, but making sure that the wider government apparatus takes into account their skills and actively engages with where the ends can take them. I think that should probably be all from me from my starting session. I shall leave it to Karina to hand on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Peter. Wonderful uh, starting for this panelist about the importance of independent academic research to inform sound policy making. Now I would like to invite our second panelist, Baker. And she is going, uh, Emma Baker is a Global Evaluation Manager for the British Council Science Portfolio. She's also Director of the UK Evaluation Society and is currently studying for a Master in Science and Social Research. Thank you so much, Emma, and um, 
over to you. Um, the conference. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of scientific evidence um, to UK government policy. I'm going to chat a little bit about barriers and opportunities for scientific knowledge in informing public policy. So I'll probably touch a little bit on some of the points that Peter has, has already made. Um, in the UK, evidence-based policy movement is becoming more influential um, across many policy areas. Locally, we've seen the creation of commission groups, health well-being boards, and, and private providers moving into areas traditionally occupied by the NHS. So there's a broader range of, of policymakers becoming potential evidence users, um, probably more than ever before here in the UK. And that means that there is growing recognition in the UK that scientific evidence can actually help to define um, policy issues and, and capture uh, the attention of, of those policy makers. Um, and actually we've, we've even seen this sort of increased pressure on our cabinet office um, who, for example, a few years ago were, were criticised for ignoring expert advice um, and were subsequently um, sort of forced to, to reverse rules on, on government grants that would have prevented um, researchers from engaging with policymakers. So we are certainly seeing the, um, the evidence-based policy movement um, growing in strength. Uh, it's also been increasingly recognised that there is a need not just for researchers and policy makers, but also for industry, business representatives, NGOs, um, civil society organisations, also to be involved um, with a more interdisciplinary approach to solving our big challenges, um, like uh, climate action and gender equality um, and life below water. Um, there is also a desire for that policy making to be forward looking um, and not just a, sort of a, a reaction to, to short term pressures. Um, but having said that, there continues to be challenges around the supply and demand of research. Um, I, I said, I'm picking up on some points that, that Peter may already have made. Um, and it's to important, I guess, for us to remember that policy cannot be sort of purely evidence-based because of all of the various economic and societal and political factors that uh, decision makers need to, to consider but we can certainly inform policy and decision making um, but that can only have an impact if there is a level of, of understanding uh, with those evidence users um, on the demand side um, and if they have an understanding of the value of evidence um, and it's not just a, a sense that, oh, well, this is just another advocacy effort from another lobbying group to them. Um, and I guess what to do here in the UK is generate a huge cohort of individual researchers supplying research and advocating for their sort of own slice of the evidence, as tempting as that might be, um, and ignoring stronger evidence um, from other meta sources. Now, the issues don't just lie with us, the researchers. Um, it does sort of, some of the issues are on the supply side as well. Um, and uh, on the demand side. So there are issues that, um, for example, DFID are, are trying to sort of overcome with some of the programs that they have also introduced, um, where they're promoting um, evidence-informed um, policy-making workshops um, and uh, working with policymakers and their staff um, to, to sort of access um, and understand and use robust evidence in their work. If we can move to the next slide then. And I've just added a little, um, hopefully you can all see the slides. Um, I've just put in a little um, snippet here from, from DFID. Um, and I think it's just important to keep this in mind actually that certainly within international development um, and addressing some of these big global challenges, it's essential that we address those in a way that's effective, efficient, um, and delivering value for money. So that's something that um, on the supply and the demand side that we need to consider. On the next slide, just to drill down into some of those barriers. Um, again, on the supply side, and again, Peter might have touched on, on some of these points already, but Research is not always timely enough in providing answers to the relevant policy questions um, and some academics can find it difficult to 
engage effectively with the, the policy process um, despite their best efforts and the great potential contribution that they can make. Um, also, many of the issues that government deals with then are not suited to the most rigorous testing um, and actually even sometimes when they are, policies are often designed in a way that, that doesn't allow for, for proper evaluation as well. There's still challenges with um, a lack of access to reliable uh, data to provide the basis for uh, strong research um, both within and outside government. Um, and there's also a risk that new forms of feedback can, can bias policy making um, compared to, to more rigorous data. And I'm sure you're all aware yourselves that organisational factors can also be a barrier. So it can be poor dissemination of research or sometimes it's uh, a lack of managerial support um, or a lack of resources um, and again staff turnover as well within institutions. On the demand side, again, more challenges that um, many political decisions are driven by values rather than outcomes. Um, and sometimes the evidence-driven answer can actually bring around um, significant political risk. And there's still challenges with lack of culture and skills for using rigorous evidence in the civil service here in the UK. Um, so there's really a need there to create um, more openness to feedback from other service providers. So big challenges, but it's, it's not all bad news, a lot of good news as well. If we just go on to, to the next slide. Uh, to talk about uh, the Newton Fund and some of the opportunities that we're providing. Um, because we're conscious with countries around the world prioritising uh, investments in science and technology and, and um, data and statistical quality, um, it is a really exciting time for the Newton Fund to, to build on that momentum, um, especially as timely access to good quality and relevant research um, uh, and evidence. Um, and it's important for collaboration with those policy makers. Um, it's also increasingly important to improve knowledge of a range of different types of evidence, including data and citizen evidence um, and experience of, of our societies. Um, and our grants are designed to foster that, hopefully. So we're fostering collaboration and relationships between policymakers and research staff. We are fostering collaboration between industry, academia and business. Um, so we're really trying to encourage that um, knowledge transfer um, and that broader look at the, those, those big challenges that we're facing. If we just go on to the next slide then, um, some of the good work that we've been doing with the Newton Fund um, that we've been recording here at the British Council. So with our programmes, um, such as institutional links, researcher links, um, as a result of those um, activities, we've had um, nearly 1,200 engagement activities recorded by our um, researchers since 2015. So they really are reaching um, broad audiences, not just um, at a local level, but internationally as well. Um, we've had 176 instances of, of policy influence, some of which is instrumental and some of which is conceptual. Um, and that includes um, participation in advisory committees, national consultations, um, and providing evidence to government uh, reviews. So that's really exciting for us to see some of that impact um, come to fruition. It's a challenge, of course, because tracking some of that impact, because as we know, it can take many years to, to influence um, these policies. Um, if we go on to the next slide then, it's just to tell you a little bit to, to sort of bring some of, of that to life. I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of our projects in Colombia. And this was one of our um, institutional links. It was a partnership between um, LSE in London, the London School of Economics, um, and Colombian University uh, Los Andes. Um, and that brought together, um, sort of with that, that ethos that I've talked about, it was about bringing together academics, practitioners and policymakers um, to have those evidence-based discussions. Um, and as a result of that, um, the researchers were able to produce um, a report after uh, the drug wars, which was then signed by uh, six Nobel uh, Prize laureates. 
and it has actually caused a major shift in, in policy making on illicit drug markets in Colombia. And we're now starting to see that have um, a sort of global influence as well as others look to that experience to learn. And that particular project has just secured a further £7 million pounds worth of funding um, from the Global Challenges Research Fund. So great for us to start to, to see that impact come through. Um, that's a lot. I feel like I've been talking for half an hour. That's <laughs> probably a bit more than 10 minutes. Um, I'll pass you back now to Karina. Thank you, Karina. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, really uh, interesting uh, sharing about the importance also of uh, keeping evidence and the researchers working together as, as a way to influence policy. Thank you so much. And, and uh, I would like to continue encouraging our participants to uh, post your questions and your comments in the chat, please. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome our third panelist. Uh, she is uh, Liliana Carral. Thank you, Corina. Liliana Carral is Head of Monitoring, Evaluation and Reporting for the Americas region with the British Council, and she was previously the head of the Newton Fund in Mexico. She's a graduate from the University of Liverpool and Universidad Iberoamericana Puebla. So uh, with that, over to you. Thank you, Liliana. Karina. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, well, what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit about the experience in Mexico and particularly uh, how we in the British Council were generating evidence and using it to uh, design uh, our programs, okay? So, uh, I don't know, Corinna, if we can, uh, yeah, share the, the presentation. So, uh, what uh, I'd like to tell you is that this was an iterative journey. It, this was an iterative journey because it... Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's about six years of uh, history uh, for the British Council, but also for for Mexico, and everything started uh, when we had a new government in place uh, about six years ago. We had a new government in place. We have to uh, start uh, drafting a new uh, a strategy for uh, higher education and. Uh, uh, and we are going to uh, we were going to start uh, negotiations with the new government to start uh, you know positioning the UK at the time. So as always happened in Latin America, every time we have uh, you know every time we have a, a, a very a new government uh, and a new ruling party, you have to start almost from zero because people tend to change everything. There's no continuity. It's, it's something that happens quite a lot. And I've seen that the UK is, for example, very different in that sense. In the UK, even if they change parties, they are more or less continue the same programs. They don't cut it off. But in here, we have to start all over again. So in 2013, we, we, very timely, we had the visit from David Willets, which was at the time the Minister for Universities and Science, in base, actually, it was uh, the Department for Business Innovation and and, uh, and uh, Innovation and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. But I think it was BIS at the time. So he came to Mexico and he brought a delegation of uh, different universities, and he was also uh, a door opener for many of the programs that we were wanting to launch at the time in 2014. Well, a year after, we had a visit from Prince Charles because he was going to inaugurate, alongside the Mexican president, the UK-Mexico dual year that happened in 2015. And in 2015, uh, as part of the UK-Mexico year, we had a bunch of activities across, uh, and it was uh, a very important um, before and after year for the UK-Mexico relationships. We had a very strong program for both arts, creative economies, um, commerce, uh, for in our case, education and science, okay? And as part of that, as part of the uh, implementations that we had, uh, the Mexican government established a parliamentary office for science and technology 
which is basically mirroring the one in the UK. So that's, that's the first time that Mexico had a dedicated office to support decision makers, policy makers, uh, by using scientific evidence. At the same time, the British Council was uh, delivering their, its own, uh, you know, um, program. So we have been collecting data and reporting uh, a, a few of that across the globe. We have about 110 country, uh, offices uh, across the world, and we have access to information about how higher education is behaving across different regions. So we produce a report that is called The Shape of Things to Come that was our basis for the strategy that we implemented in the British Council of Mexico. In 2013, just in parallel with David Willets, we were uh, launching the Researcher Links program, which are grants for bilateral workshops between Mexico and UK researchers. In 2014, uh, a few months before the visit of Prince Charles, we were part of the launch of the Newton Fund in Mexico, and we launched a second program, which is called Institutional Links. And that program, Institutional Links, uh, is the one that I'm going to talk a little bit more about but it became a flagship program for Mexico because we really made it uh, adaptable to the specific agenda of the current government. And then uh, in 2015, as part of our work, we were also pushing to have a very uh, a strong relationship between Mexico and UK uh, higher education uh, systems. So we encouraged and supported this, the uh, signing of a bilateral treaty for the mutual recognition of qualifications, which will enable not only academic exchanges, but also a more closer collaboration for transnational education between our countries. So this has been the pathway, and the UK has become a key partner for Mexico in science, technology, and innovation development during this time. So what happened afterwards? We started to use evidence for the uh, design of the institutional links and other programs as well. In 2015, uh, CONACYT, our partner in, in Mexico, and British Council run a series of workshops to guide and assess initial outcomes of the Institutional Links program. We collected data through different uh, sources, project presentations, focus groups, and reports from the grantees, from the researchers that received the grants uh, in the Institutional Links program. And we identify a case study that became a flagship case within Newton Fund Network, I think. It's one of the most successful case studies that we have identified across the Newton Fund in different countries, uh, which is the Neglected and Emerging Infectious Diseases Network between the Oxford Nuffield Department of Medicine and Mexican universities, which we documented in the year after. And as part of that, we also were doing uh, research about the skills for innovation that were needed in Mexico. So uh, we identified from the workshops in institutional links, from all the collecting data that we did with the institutional link grantees, that uh, we needed to train the tra technology transfer offices in basic technology uh, transfer skills. They were technology transfer offices. I didn't know how to do technology transfer. Uh, so they can support better institutional links, for example. We also identified that we needed to redesign the program to ensure better results. And we also use the, uh, the Skills for Innovation report, where we uh, surveyed a huge number of researchers, technology transfer offices, higher education institutions, and enterprises uh, into what were the skills that people needed in order to start doing innovation that is applicable and useful uh, for both the higher education institutions and the industries. So um, with all this evidence that we collected, we uh, started to design some programs. So in 2016, we uh, used all this data to develop a training for technology transfer offices uh, that was assigned uh, and, and funded under the Newton Fund Strand uh, Professional Development and Engagement. And we did it in partnership with the Ministry of Economy. And we redesigned the second call for Newton Fund Institutional Links to ensure better outcomes from working groups. So we use this data also to redesign our Institutional Links program. In 2017, we took a, a step further ahead and, and, and answering the question on if, if some uh, policymakers are aware that they need, uh, you know, some scientific advisory. In, in the Ministry of Energy in Mexico and with our support, 
we identified that we did indeed needed support from the scientists to design this school. So we had a bilateral workshop with UK and Mexican experts in energy. We made them work together in four working groups where they at the same time identify some categories for the call. We were working on their uh, different areas like uh, biofuels, like for example, maritime energy, like uh, <clears throat> uh, just spatial uh, planning for, for energy renewables, etc. So we identified uh, eight subcategories for the call and they actually were advisors of that call. Interestingly enough, uh, we didn't have many applications from them, but a couple of them actually were successful in applying for, for, for the call afterwards. What happened afterwards was a very interesting turning point because we realized that we were training researchers, we were working with technology transfer offices, with entrepreneurs, but always policymakers were the big question mark. So when I was um, going to, you know, do like this legacy, uh, legacy assessment for the Newton Fund in Mexico, I came with this idea basically, and it was, uh, if, if we are going to have a major legacy in the Newton Fund, I mean, from the Newton Fund in Mexico, would, it would be that we are putting the sustainable development goals at the core of the science, technology, and innovation policy, that we are using the sustainable development goals as the mandatory uh, rule in how science, technology, and innovation should be working. And that was perhaps the main contribution of the Newton Fund in Mexico. So having thought that, I designed a program, uh, actually it was more like terms of reference for a supplier to actually come and present a proposal. And the response we found was transformative innovation, okay? So transformative inno innovation in a nutshell is doing innovation in a different way. Uh, the traditional way is that um, the governments spend money um, in uh, areas that are needed for the economic development. Uh, they have to invest in, uh, for example, automotive industry because it's important for, for the country. They will invest in that. But it's always going to be, uh, you know, up to down uh, the, the, the way it works. It's hierarchical. And, and in the traditional approaches, they don't usually involve people from the grassroots, okay? So transformative innovation thinks the other way around. They think that if you want to do innovation, you have to start bottom up, okay? And if you start doing bottom up, you have to involve uh, people that are not necessarily uh, research-based innovation actors. It could be entrepreneurs, it could be innov innovation people, grassroots level people, you know, the people that are really facing the problems. So they become part of the science, technology, and innovation ecosystem. So to the what we did the last uh, year, we have been doing the last year, is how, how we actually were going to do uh, transformative innovation in Mexico, is that uh, first and foremost, at the very, very first step, um, in, in, in that case, we, we started with a training program in, at the very beginning of the, of the uh, year. We had a training program delivered by the University of Sussex, um, and uh, the idea was to introduce uh, the policymakers to transformative innovation and identify opportunities. As outcomes of this, we have two outcomes. <clears throat> the first one was a report that helped us to map uh, current policies in Mexico that fit transformative innovation. And the second outcome was uh, establish a working group to perform a case study on transformative innovation in Southeast Mexico. So that's how we started all this revolution. Afterwards, what we <coughs> let them do, and it was something that was a consequence of this workshop, is that our partners <coughs> on the following months, they identified other programs where they wanted to, to work. And particularly, they adapted and cascaded the trainings to a specific audiences. So as outcomes of this, we had, for example, uh, that they have uh, uh, started to develop new case studies, new case studies using uh, their own uh, local methodology, for example. And uh, the other outcome that we, uh, that we identified is that uh, 
the two main partners that were working with us, uh, that are CONACYT and the uh, Foro Consultivo Científico y Tecnológico, the scientific forum, uh, they identified four priority areas of work, which considered training, considering more training, more cascade training, but also policy experimentation, policy research, and policy evaluation. So what is next? After this has happened the last months, it's, uh, we are having this very que big question mark about transformative innovation phase two. We think that it's important that we have a second phase of transformative innovation. And there are two aims in this. The first aim would be to uh, continue working on, 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 the, on the policy experimentation and policy evaluation to develop uh, uh, um, a new uh, transformative innovation uh, framework in Mexico, okay? And also explore uh, how other uh, aspects of transformative innovation can be replicated in Mexico. And it's, I think this is uh, one of the major areas where we will be uh, trying to push for an agenda because now we are having uh, some challenges that I'm going to talk on the, on the next slide. So the challenges we have now are the common ones in Latin America. We have a new government and we have a new ruling party again. So continuity is going to be one problem, especially because they come with a very, very different vision. In Mexico, uh, the left wing party won and they are coming to revolutionize. It's going to be a revolution, okay? And they are more inward looking and will prioritize relationships with Latin America over to other countries like the UK. So the UK may no longer have a, the predominant role that we have in the previous year that we contributed to achieve in the previous year. So this is a very big challenge. Funding, of course, is an issue. We, we hope that we can get more support from uh, Newton Fund to continue transformative innovation because it's, a, it's an important program that will keep us in the game with the new government. Uh, but also we hope that the new government will keep funding this uh, this program and it also is is an opportunity because when you see transformative innovation and the new agenda from the mexican government the new government it actually fits very well because it's it's uh, it's actually very pertinent to the realities in mexico they are don't they don't want to work with the traditional uh, science and technology partners they want to involve the people to make it more democratic so we believe that it fits perfectly with a new agenda and it's perhaps a key to open the door or keep open the door for UK Mexico collaboration. So this is in a nutshell the case of Mexico. Thank you so much, uh, Liliana. A very valuable experience from Mexico. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, encourage our participants to uh, post their questions and comments. We actually have some excellent comments and questions. And I would like our panelists to come before in the come forward in the video. And uh, the first question that we have is um, for Peter: How policymakers know by themselves what they need for their decisions? Is there any experience about this issue? Over to you, Peter. That's a, <laughs> a hard question and a good question. I think. I'm trying to think. Partially, in the, in the most simplistic terms, if you find yourself putting a suggestion to a minister and you don't have any reference, you don't have any numbers, you don't have any estimates, and you don't have any sort of, you find yourself writing something and you begin to feel that you're working just a bit too much on intuition. I think that uh, sort of starts to niggle at you and it comes more instinctively that you really do need to look for something. Realistically, on most of those occasions, there is something there. You just haven't gone and sought it. Um, I think also when I referred back to the professional networks within government, partially having scientists and engineers placed through teams and structured through government departments means that you can find someone a little bit more immediately accessible. I don't find myself 
having to looking at what I'm suggesting and thinking, oh, I must go and consult the sort of the grandest university in town. I can, because of these networks, go to perhaps someone in my team, perhaps someone across the floor, but someone far more accessible who can give me the more informed view of somebody who is at least from a scientific background or a research background. I think that's the answer from me. Um, I shall leave myself off mute, but um, if others want to pitch in. <laughs> okay, the question now is for Emma. What is the ideal profile of a policymaker how, so that he or she can properly include both academics and practitioners' insights? In terms of experience, would it be ideal that policymakers need first experience in research? Again, a good, a good question. I'm going to turn it on its head a little bit. And what I would say is, what do you think could make you the ideal researcher? <laughs> because what we have to remember is where a policymaker isn't necess necessarily someone who has a science or research background, you know, it's really, it's our job to be able to communicate to them in a way that they understand. Um, and that can be about the way in which the, the language that we use. And we also have to try and not just demystify a lot of the science, but we really have to be able to talk about the, the sort of longer term impacts um, in terms of the research. So I think it's also then as well understanding um, the, the policy making process as well. So it's trying to understand as well that the pressures that that policymaker is all, also experiencing. So even little things around how we communicate with them, they're never going to sit and read you know, a, a 10,000 word piece of research, they don't have time. They need to have something that, that they can take, uh, you know, into a meeting and have in three pages the, the key information that they need. So I would say don't necessarily think about the ideal policymaker, but do try to think about how you can be um, the ideal researcher in, in terms of providing that evidence. I'm not sure it does make a huge difference difference if they have had a, a background in research um, I think that because it's it's about and again it kind of comes back to that that point I made earlier that we don't exist in this world where it's um, research and policy maker there are lots of different influences that that sort of happen before the magic of a, a policy um, change happening so or, or a new policy being created um, so I, I don't know the ideal policy maker I guess in, a, in an ideal world is somebody who has a grasp of these issues at a grassroots level somebody who has a grasp of the the science and the evidence that they need to, to enforce um, change. Um, but I guess they're probably some of these policymakers just under about as much pressure as we are as well. You know, we're all um, time poor. So I guess it's about trying to, to reach that policymaker in, in uh, you know, the most um, efficient way possible with your research. So it's not quite maybe the answer you were looking for, but hopefully, um, yeah, be the change that you want to see, I guess. Thank you so much, Emma. And uh, I'd like to read one of the comments from one of our participants, and that is, I think British Council can strengthen links between researchers and policymakers by providing contact details of relevant policy contact in governmental agencies for each country, example, in Peru. This would enable the scientists to be able to ask guidance what policymakers need from science and allow the scientists then feed results back. This dialogue is important, but hard to establish for scientists who do now always know how to contact or who to contact to get the replies from BC policymakers. I think this is a reality that we face. And part of our work in the Newton Fund is actually to promote the strengthen of the relationships between policymakers and scientists. I will go ahead and uh, make the next question for our panelist Liliana. And the question is, uh, how has been the experience in Mexico in terms of the support of the national government? Could you identify any conflict of interest that limited the potential of any policy? Over to you, Liliana. Yeah, sure. Um, 
I mean, I, I think it's two questions. The first question is about particularly our experience and, and how the Mexican government has received uh, the proposal of working with policymakers through the Newton Fund. I think they actually were very, very open. The current government, I'm, I'm talking about the current people that are still in government and that will change in December. So it's going to be very different in December. But the current government has been very, very open and very supportive. I think they were aware that uh, policymakers in science and uh, technology needed support from different uh, uh, people, uh, particularly the Foro Consultivo Científico y Tecnológico, the uh, Scientific Forum. It's, a, it's an organism that actually does policymaking uh, research for science and technology uh, policies. So they were actually the first endorsers, aside from CONACYT, for this program. And they were very keen, on, and they are continuously being very keen on working, working on that one. Uh, I think uh, the problem we are facing now with the change of government is that uh, the continuation of policies is always going to be an issue because they come with a different agenda, with a different vision. And I believe uh, there are certain programs in Mexico, particularly in, in innovation strand, that uh, were not the didn't have the success that they expected and somehow they have been financing uh public private companies and that's something that i believe it's going to cause conflict of interest because some companies actually uh you know use a lot of uh, public money to finance their own company and that's not well seen so i think the government that is coming into a uh, position now is going to change a lot of those programs probably they're going to finish a few of them um, but I think in the case of transformative innovation, we see the potential for it to continue as long as we have funds and also the goodwill from the new government. Thank you so much, Liliana. We have a question here for any of our panelists. So any of you, Emma, Peter or Liliana, please jump in. What is the level of engagement of social science research in the initiatives described? And can you briefly share any multidisciplinary research project experience? Um, I'll just I'll make a, a general comment and maybe Liliana might want to talk about a, a project that's quite specific um, in, in Latin America. I think what we really do try to encourage and it's very much built into the objectives of the Newton Fund is that we are looking at the end users of, um, of the research um, and the policies. So it's very much about trying to, for example, work with not just academics but and policymakers, but local community groups as well. So for example, that could be um, looking at how um, a vaccination has to actually be administered by local people in the community. Um, and that really does involve having to work with local community groups. So we really do encourage uh, the research groups to work with local communities as well and, and look at the social research that 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 requires to really understand the the end uh, beneficiaries of the research just to pitch in from the uk end um i think um if we discount economists who uh, we all have to acknowledge around the world um the social science research field is the strongest amongst the government departments that element around sort of behavior how one works with it how one influences behavior and how that may actually influence how the most delightfully logical policy will actually play out in practice it means that the social sciences have a massive role and the social scientist network is one of the largest across the government departments thank you uh, we have a question for Liliana here. Uh, what is the influence of educational research in policy making and the device of public educational programs? Okay, this is this is a difficult question I have to say because everything that is around education, at least in Mexico, is very political, and uh, and and I will give you a little bit of background. There is a lot of research in Mexico about education. We have. The strongest, uh, I think, in, 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 in education evaluation uh, or institution is the CIDE. CIDE is actually the house of the CLEAR Latin American chapter. CLEAR is the 
the you know uh, creme de la creme uh, of evaluation across the world and they are really good in evaluators they actually presented a proposal to evaluate the Newton fund in Mexico they didn't win but they are very very good and they have produced a lot of research about education however producing the research and using the research uh, there's a gap there, you know, and the gap is mainly because uh, uh, the government that is in charge of implementing the policies have all their press pressing points. And in Mexico, the particular pressing point in education is uh, uh, the union, the teachers union. Because of teachers union, uh, the Mexican government tried to, you know, establish a, 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 an education reform which wasn't exactly an education reform, it was more like a labor reform for educators. And um, it was not well received within the teachers because they have now to be evaluated. They have to demonstrate that they have capacities and they don't like that because their job is actually in jeopardy. It's weird, I know, but they obviously have been teaching for a long time and uh, they don't want to miss their uh, own you know, uh, benefits that they have already achieved. So the new government has decided that the uh, educational reform is not go longer going to take place. So it doesn't matter that much the research, okay? The research is important. They have advised some ideas, like for example, how to uh, develop a new curriculum. For example, in Mexico, we have a very good experience in uh, STEM education through the Mexican Academy of Sciences. Uh, they have developed a very good program based on research that they produced uh, on uh, to support uh, teachers in Mexico who are not scientists and who are really afraid of actually going into the lab to perform very basic lab uh, activities uh, and, and be able to deliver the classes, uh, the science classes in general. However, uh, this is just uh, like a, a light in the tunnel, you know, it's, it's an exception, I would say, and not necessarily the rule. So uh, it's a still a, a, a difficult area to actually have influence. But I believe uh, it depends a lot on how well the, the government is connected with the researchers in education, but also how uh, open they are to negotiate with the union, which are always, you know, reluctant uh, to change in general. Thank you so much, uh, Liliana. Uh, I'd like to uh, go to our final question because the time is uh, almost over. And the question is, Peru is not part of the OECD countries. This would be considered a disadvantage to receive collaboration or support from the Newton Fund or British Council? The answer to that question is to the contrary. Um, Countries that are eligible for Newton Fund collaboration uh, through the British Council and other delivery partners are, uh, in fact, the what we call official development assistance eligible countries, meaning that they haven't made it yet to the OECD and they are in the process of developing and there is an interest and an intention to support the economic development and the social welfare of those countries. So, I like to say that we are in the first year of implementation of the Newton Fund in Peru. Our country partner is Concitec, and uh, we have already um, uh, funded uh, research projects, travel grants, and we are about to um, announce the nomination of the winners of a call for institutional links for uh, longer efforts of collaboration. Usually we bring together uh, Peruvian scientists and UK scientists to collaborate for different areas of uh, research. And in the case of Peru, we have prioritized water, health, and biodiversity. Uh, with that said, and being almost at the top of the hour, I really would like to thank you, all of you, uh, especially our panelists, for sharing your knowledge, your expertise, your insights, and our Participants, thank you so much for joining this virtual conference call. And um, on behalf of the Newton Fund and also uh, Semana de la Evidencia, we really want to thank you for your interest, for your comments, for your questions. And let's keep um, looking for better ways to bring the, this interface between policymakers and researchers a reality, both in Peru as well as in other countries in Latin America, building on the experience, the learnings, and the knowledge.
thank you so much for your participation. And um, I would like to finally uh, say that you can uh, look for us at the Newton Fund, um, at www.newtonfund.ac.uk, and you can find a lot of information about what we're doing globally and uh, particularly in Peru and in Latin America. Thank you so much to all of you and have a wonderful remaining of your day. And uh, Corina, just uh, I read that somebody wanted to have the uh, slides. Will you be sharing the slides? We will be sharing the slides and uh, hopefully the recording also to all the people who have participated and who have registered. Yes, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Liliana. You. Thank you. Thank you.